Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Communication Corner. I'm your host, Gail Lewis, wearing plaid today in celebration of the Irish. Joining me here today on Communication Corner is an entrepreneur, a student of history and also a journalist, none other than then Jerry Regan. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Gail. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Communication Corner. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, so in celebration of the Irish, I'm wearing a little plaid today. <laughs> I thought I'd get a little festive. All things Irish is what we're discussing today on Communication Corner because I like to look at the ways that communities uh, communicate and specifically ethnic communities. So that's why we've got you on today. Um, your website, wi The Wild Geese, dot com celebrates all things Irish. All things Irish, particularly with a with a look back. Mm -hmm. We we uh, are forward looking, but we look at the past with, while con ironically being forward looking, mm -hmm. we use all of the media tools that are available to us now to explore the Irish experience mm -hmm. around the world. It's a it's a the Irish diaspora is large and vast. Mm -hmm. it, it rivals and arguably even surpasses the Jewish diaspora, mm -hmm. which is one of the best known uh, communities worldwide. And it, it's our great pleasure to use our new media, mm -hmm. which is, becomes more and more accessible to everyone in the world, to explore that rich vein of Irish experience around mm -hmm. the world. So the wildgeese.com explores all things Irish all over the world throughout the diaspora. And you're an explorer of history yourself. So you, you mentioned looking back and looking forward. So uh, let's, let's start with looking back a little bit about you, Jerry. Ex when I just introduced you, we talked about you're an explorer of history, you're a journalist, you're an entrepreneur. It, it seems as if you're a jack of all trades. Tell us more about you. Sure, yeah. Uh, I, I'm a guess in one sense I'm I feel like a quintessential Queens resident, mm -hmm. although I was not born in Queens. I was born in Manhattan. Uh, I was born out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. I was adopted as an infant, and my parents brought me out to Long Island, where I grew up. I grew up in New Hyde Park, mm -hmm. which is just just across the border. I just you just miss Queens by uh, that much. But I could <laughs> ride my bike and get to the Queens line in about ten minutes. So. Okay, but your parents were from the parents who raised you. They were from Queens. Yes, mm -hmm. my my dad was born in Richmond Hill. Mm -hmm. Went to John Adams High School, ah. and my mom went to. Uh, my mom grew up in South Ozone Park mm -hmm. and also went to John Adams. In fact, they met in the hallways there. Really? Yeah. High school sweethearts? Well, yeah, my dad was a monitor. Well, yes, mm -hmm. they were, in fact. He was mm -hmm. a high school monitor, and he had a, a good eye, and he, he saw this really <laughs> hot-looking woman down the hall. Uh -huh. And, you know, the rest, I guess you could argue, was history. They went out and never mm -hmm. looked back. So Love it. Yeah, and I went to Holy Cross High School. Mm -hmm. so Right here in Queens? Yeah, mm -hmm. a, a fine Queens institution. A good Catholic school. Absolutely. <laughs> Still is today. And uh, although we weren't paired with Mary Lewis, but ah. uh, it's in a sense it was a sister school. So yes. Mm -hmm. Might have shared a few bus stops, not with me directly, but maybe with some of my classmates. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but we had, quite a, we had quite a few Irish kids in, in Holy Cross, no mm -hmm. surprises. I'm mm -hmm. sure you had Irish classmates or people, Absolutely. kids of Irish ancestry in, in, in Mary Lewis. Uh -huh. It's a when you look at Ireland, which today is a population of four million people on the mm -hmm. veritable fringes of Europe, and look at the impact it, ha it has had, this nation has had on, on cultures and the destinies of so many nations, it, it mm -hmm. just cries out for exploration, which is what we do with the wild geese every day. So there's four million Irish actually living in Ireland. Yeah. It seems as if there's four million Ir Irish living in New York City. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> when I was in, when I was a student in Trinity College, Dublin, 1973, right. there was a, a joke. It went something like, uh, "What's the capital of Ireland?" Mm -hmm. And the answer is Liverpool. Mm -hmm. How's that? Well, because there is six million pe Irish living in Liverpool, <laughs> and there are four million in the entire country of, of Ireland. Of Ireland. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that was representative, though, of just mm -hmm. how far flung right. the Irish have become. It seems as if one of their best imports uh, outside of Guinness, of course, would be their people. That well spoken, yes. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone would want to debate that, yeah. 
the Irish have been nation builders uh, mm -hmm. in the United States. They've contributed mightily to the establishment of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. They've contributed mightily to the development of Australia. Right. Uh, Bernardo O'Higgins uh, mm -hmm. is a liberator of uh, parts of South America from Spanish thraldom. Mm -hmm. You have uh, Admiral Brown, who was the uh, created the Argentine Navy. He was born right. in Ireland. Really? I mean, the story goes on and on. I mean, you had mm -hmm. Irish Brigade in the service of France, which actually gave root, gave birth to the term the Wild Geese. But th that's mm -hmm. a longer story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we're looking back into your background. You mentioned studying in Ireland. Uh, when did you do that? How how did that work out? Uh, you took some time off from your yeah. studies here? Yeah, I, you know, prior to my sophomore year, I was a student at Duke University. I did my mm -hmm. undergraduate work at Duke, and I, I had a, a, an awareness of Ireland and, and a, a, an interest in Irish culture, mm -hmm. but probably no deeper than anyone else who, who had tangentially Irish parents or, right. or uh, parents of Irish ancestry. Mm -hmm. When I decided I wanted to broaden my horizons by studying abroad for my third year, I mm -hmm. looked at two schools. I looked at University of Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and I looked at, at Trinity College, Dublin. I, not coincidentally, I had, I had seen the movie um, Pride, Pride of, Prime of Miss Jean Brody right. at the time, and Edinburgh, I was enthralled at the beauty of Edinburgh, which Ar was the, the architecture, the rolling hills out, outside of Just the city. Just the sheer lyricism. Yeah. Of, of, uh, and it was a beautifully crafted film. And then I uh, to make a longer story shorter, I was not accepted at the University of Edinburgh, so, oh, but I was accepted at Trinity College Dublin. Blessedly, I had just seen the film Ryan's Daughter <laughs> by the great filmmaker David Lean, of Shiv Dr. Zhivago. So. Yes, yes. And I, I fell in, I quickly transferred my love from Edinburgh to Dublin. Okay. And <laughs> that hence led to my now Six, a 40-year adventure with Irish culture. Wow. So you went abroad. You spent your junior year abroad in, um, uh, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And you came back a changed man? I think I came back with a more mature, I would mm -hmm. say, and with a broader, less, more, uh, more adult-like perspective. Mm -hmm. I think like a, like a lot of ch children of the middle class, uh, mm -hmm. especially the white middle class, mm -hmm. I was given a lot. In, a, in one sense, I was spoiled. The, the real sense of struggle wasn't, right. wasn't there for me. Mm -hmm. So in being away from home, uh, all of the influences, the, the, the pampering and the helicopterism that right. was seemed part and parcel of so much of my childhood, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I just found I, I had a stronger sense of who I was and what I wanted to do with my life. When you came back. But that's an ongoing process. I, I still wonder what I'm going to do when I grow up. So. <laughs> I'm, well, mm -hmm. I'm a, I, what I, I'm always drawn to the childlike aspects of, of, of each of us, you know. I mm -hmm. think we're all big, big kids at heart, and I never want to lose that. Actually. I love that. That is great. So when you grow up, one of the things that, uh, that you're doing as, as more of a grown-up, I don't want to say that you're grown-up yet. I'm still going to give you plenty of room to grow. Oh, thank you. But uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things that you're doing as a grown-up is thewildgeese.com, and that celebrates Irish history, Irish culture, would you say, um, how would you categorize the website, thewildgeese.com? Well, the, all right, the Wild Geese is a social network mm -hmm. devoted to exploring and celebrating, that's important, the mm -hmm. experience of the Irish worldwide. Mm -hmm. As we've discussed, the, the Irish have struggled uh, to get a foothold in virtually every land that they've settled and done so with admirable success, Absolutely. with notable success. Mm -hmm. They've become pioneers and innovators in virtually every field of human endeavor, mm -hmm. technology, uh, the arts, uh, theater. Uh, uh, the list goes it, on and on. It, right. it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's a nearly endless array of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a focus rife for exploration, which we endeavor to do every day, 24-7, mm -hmm. 365, with the help of online technology, mm -hmm. new media, if you will. Right. And how did the idea for the wild geese come about? I actually, was, one of my passions, which we, we haven't really explored, mm -hmm. was reenacting, well, living history. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've always felt that a valid way of exploring the past is by donning its material culture, and that right. would be the clothing. In the, in, the, in the instance of a, of a soldier wearing mm -hmm. the, the weaponry. And for people who are not familiar with reenacting, just, just explain exactly what it is. Well, reenacting is an attempt to 
portray a particular mm -hmm. facet of the past. Right. It could be a military experience, it could mm -hmm. be a civilian experience. Mm -hmm. Those are the more common right. avenues for reenactment. Uh, the idea of Colonial Williamsburg comes to mind, uh, uh, places like that that just kind of uh, live the history, sure. if you will. Yeah, mm -hmm. and historical sites increasingly are adding that to their mix to attract audiences. Mm -hmm. It's not only more colorful, but it's more appealing for, for tourists to visitors to get a, a more visu on, visual right. sense mm -hmm. of what, what people wore and what they did back mm -hmm. then. How Churning they the butter and, and yeah, doing yeah. those actual uh, things that you would do uh, back in the day. So mm -hmm. to your question, I, yeah. I was astounded in 1996 to read in the New York Times that there were people reenacting the American Civil War. Yes. I, I'd never heard of it. I'd never encountered it. Civil War reenactors, alive yeah. and well, yes. So uh, actually that was 1986 mm -hmm. and I decided to explore that. So I got involved in Civil War reenacting and I thought mm -hmm. this was uh, very exciting uh, to portray period people who've long been long gone to, to become them in a sense or mm -hmm. to try to from the skin out right. and employ all of my senses, mm -hmm. not just the intellectual, Right, but, but your the tactile, ta the tactile, exactly, yeah. and the mm -hmm. the the physical, uh, the, mm -hmm. the even straining to carry a rifle for a long distance or right. to ride a horse, mm -hmm. things that people took for granted back in the day. Mm -hmm. I was constantly gaining insights as to what it was like to have been involved in the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. So I met a, I met some colleagues who shared my interest in Irish culture mm -hmm. through Civil War reenacting, and we Joe. Gannon became my partner in the Wild Geese. Mm -hmm. And as we grew older, I became less involved in reenacting, and I gave more of my attention to the Irish role in world history. Mm -hmm. And that's been largely my uh, prime focus, not the exclusive focus, but the prime focus for me. And mm -hmm. since really we launched the Wild Geese as a Veritable labor of love, really. It was, mm -hmm. it was an online magazine for its first 16 years, uh, mm -hmm. which basically is a one-way conversation. We right. would we would put stories and put front content of out people. Right. Mm -hmm. But last year we decided that we wanted to make it a, a multiple, a two-way conversation. A get, social get on. network. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's we changed track. We we adopted the social media model mm -hmm. for the Wild Geese. And so now people are. contribute to the site. Yeah, we have mm -hmm. 1,650 members. We get more each day mm -hmm. uh, since we reinvented ourselves in March. So that's mm -hmm. not a, a bad number. We're it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, 160 a month on average. Mm -hmm. And members, to, much to our pleasure, or, or many some members, you know, there are mm -hmm. ma many members who are still content to just learn about, read our content. Right. Uh, but there, there are some activist members who are vigorously creating content, sharing their Irish stories with us, mm -hmm. uh, their perspectives on Irish culture, their expertise in, mm -hmm. in many cases. And we are able to highlight the work and right. present it to the larger body of our readership um, using different devices that our community makes, the technology makes right. it. Yeah, because of the technology, you can just share it with everyone ev everywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. So social media, it certainly mm -hmm. facilitates getting building a readership mm -hmm. beyond beyond our, our members. One of the uh, the stories that I noticed on thewildgeese.com had to do with St. Nick. Um, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, yeah. this is a story that I, I, I stumbled over, uh, stumbled upon. Uh -huh. I had no idea that St. Nick had any, any Irish antecedents. Right. And one of my colleagues brought it to my attention that there is a site in County Kilkenny that claim to have or claims to have the remains of venerable St. Nick, the, the, the inspiration Santa for Claus. modern, right. sounds mm -hmm. crazy to say modern <laughs> concept of Santa Claus, right. but taking the term modern loosely. The more modern version of yeah, Santa. Modern right. meaning the last couple of hundred years. And we decided to give voice to the, to the farmer that actually owns the, what he, she claims is the burial site of St. Right. Nick and mm -hmm. explain her justify her, that claim because mm -hmm. it, it, it seemed 
colorful, to say the least. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. there are other places in the world, I think Italy most notably, that claim to have St. Nick's remains also. Yes. Uh, but so we'll let, we'll let them fight it out. You know, what I've always loved about my forays into journalism is mm -hmm. that as a journalist, when I wear that hat, I'm not obligated, I'm just obligated to present the facts as we know them. Mm -hmm. The reader can decide. Can make the final decision. Yeah. Well, we can help the reader out in making the final decision. We do have that clip from your website about St. Nick, so let's roll that. Here's a clip from thewildgeese.com. I had retired from farming, you see, and retirement didn't suit me at all. And uh, I had three choices, go mad, die, or do something. So I bought this and uh, we weren't long here when someone came to the door looking for St. Nicholas's tomb. And uh, uh, like this, this didn't look to be important to us at the time. I thought the field here where the town was would be ideal for wintering cattle. And uh, it would be totally lost only for the Heritage Council. And they came along and they were very cooperative, very easy to work with, and they wrote uh, a preservation book on it. And it's only then we really realised what we had. Medieval historian and abbot of Glenstall, Mark Patrick Hederman, said the first time he saw the grave at Newtown Jerpoint, he felt the presence of St. Nicholas. He's the patron saint of generosity and philanthropy. I'm certain he is present here and that the people of this country are meant to take notice of that and be attentive to his presence because he's a very important saint. He is actually venerated in both parts of the church, that's to say the Orthodox and the Catholic, long before the Protestant Reformation. So he's a Christianity which belongs to ancient Celtic Christianity and it's ecumenical, it's with all Christians. Saint Nicholas, said to be the inspiration for Santa Claus, died in Myra in Turkey in 343 AD. So how did his remains arrive in Kilkenny? The Middle Ages were absolutely obsessed about relics and the Normans were plunderers and they just, they took graves because they wanted saints who were the most important saints to be where they were establishing monasteries and they established the monasteries to keep the people under control. They were the ones who brought the body of Saint Nicholas to Bari and to Venice and to here. The site where the grave and church are located is in what was once a thriving Norman town. What remains has been described in a report by the Heritage Council as one of the most important sites in the study of medieval settlements in Ireland. All the remains are there. 13th, 14th century artworks, medieval church, dedication to St Nicholas. But what makes it really special is we have all the documents. It's the sense that it's so well preserved, it was never built on. Uh, it shows us the lesson of what happens to towns if you don't look after them. Sometimes they fail. And there's a huge amount of knowledge and learning just ready and waiting to be untapped. If you go to the graveyard, you see the supposed tomb of St. Nicholas. So that was our clip about, the, uh, about St. Nick. So uh, I guess short of uh, DNA testing, we'll never really know. Uh, no, well, I, I <laughs> certainly have it. You know, again, what I, what I love about what I do is I don't, it's not on me to launch an investigative piece, <laughs> you know. Uh, maybe there are journalists out there that would like to get to the bottom of it. Maybe we can send Geraldo Rivera or... <laughs> you, you know, we, we try to cover a broad swath of Irish culture. Right. And if there are people, and typically they're academics, who want to mm -hmm. explore in more depth, mm -hmm. we welcome that. And we'll invite them to come into our community and share their right. findings with us. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the dyna dynamic that we're looking to create. Mm -hmm. People who share our passion for our, the Irish experience around the world coming into our online corridors mm -hmm. and sharing what they know, right. and getting the feedback and getting the satisfaction of <coughs> furthering our c collective understanding of the Irish experience mm -hmm. around the world. 
Uh, where is your staff physically? I find this this interesting. Where is your fa your staff physically uh, located? Our our content coordinator Ryan O'Rourke is mm -hmm. based in County Galway, Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, our our business development coordinator is in County is in Connemara, which is in County. It's a beautiful part of Ireland in County Galway, also. Mm -hmm. In the that's more of the country. It's, it's in the <coughs> on the Atlantic mm -hmm. coast on the western part of the Atlantic seaboard of right. Ireland. Uh, Belinda Evangelista, who I, I call our our customer, uh, our customer our chief relationship officer, CRO. <laughs> She's got a real gift for building bridges between people and mm -hmm. organizations. She's in Syracuse. She's Dublin born. Mm -hmm. We have our our marketing coordinator, Tiffany Silverberg, is located in California, mm -hmm. and we have a. a a couple of new additions to our team just this past week. One, mm -hmm. Mark Connor is mm -hmm. in the Twin Cities, which is a surprisingly mm -hmm. Irish town. Actually. Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minneapolis really? Saint okay. Paul, particularly St. Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, you know, the saga, the Irish typically traveled the highways, the 19th century highways, which tended mm -hmm. to be waterways. So right. mm -hmm. looking for work, looking for opportunity. With the advent of St. Paul, well, there was plenty of jobs. You know, they were, they were building a new city on the water. There mm -hmm. was plenty of work on the docks, mm -hmm. deckhands, mm -hmm. and you know, the Irish stepped up and, and took to that work. And it they're a vital, a vibrant presence mm -hmm. in St. Paul to the day. So, it, is that how uh, the Irish came to New York as well? Uh, because of uh, the, obviously uh, Ellis Island, etc. But the waterways uh, work was here. Uh, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I can speak anecdotally because mm -hmm. obviously it's not my story, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, New York was a gateway. Right. Philadelphia was a gateway. Mm -hmm. Boston were a gateway. It's not a coincidence that mm -hmm. those are three of the greatest Irish cities in the world today, mm -hmm. with the most vibrant, and Chicago, of course, as well. Didn't mean to neglect Chicago. <laughs> Cleveland also has a very Cleveland. vibrant Irish cultural scene as well. Uh -huh. uh, but as to New York, sure, New York was probably the gateway uh, in mm -hmm. the colonial times and right up until this present day for newly arrived immigrants. Mm -hmm. The Irish came. Many of the Irish state, some pushed inland for mm -hmm. more opportunity. So that would but be to Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul. Buffalo, Syracuse, okay. mm -hmm. uh, all points west. I mean, mm -hmm. when we say the Irish diaspora is far flung, I mean, we're not kidding. I mean, the Irish mm -hmm. are a major presence in virtually every state of the United States. And what uh, would typically would happen, an immigrant would find plant roots in mm -hmm. a locale, and then they would invite their family to join them. Right. Usually it was the man who would come first, and then mm -hmm. he'd invite his wife or his sisters to come along. And they would smooth the way for those that came after them. Right. A as every immigrant group, uh, yeah. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a very <coughs> a time Typical honored of, yeah. pattern. Mm -hmm. Every immigrant group tends to look after their own. Right. Uh, so where, where in Queens would we find uh, a, a, a swath or a patch or oh, well, a, there's a few places. Certainly, uh -huh. Woodside and Sunnyside are mm -hmm. most notable. Uh, I know of a few Irish, really first-rate Irish performers that uh -huh. live in Woodside, Sunnyside today. I thought you were going to say Irish bars. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are still uh, some hang hangers-on in, mm -hmm. in terms of Irish bars in those communities. Right. I, I, you know, the demographics of Woodside and Sunnyside are changing absolutely dramatically, mm -hmm. but there's still a very visible Irish. The presence roots there. are there. Yeah. What's next for Jerry Regan? for the next act for Jerry Regan. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I definitely want Because you've been entrepreneur, you've been a uh, uh, journalist, you've been all things Irish. What's next? Well, Historian. Got, I, I, I definitely want to take the wild geese to the promised land, which is mm -hmm. profitability mm -hmm. and sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, that accomplished, I, I have a, a great story, a family history story that I think has a lot of cinematic possibilities. All right. So a book then, of course, a movie. And I'm and interestingly enough and esoterically enough, I'm also hugely interested in the history of New Hyde Park, where I okay. grew up. Is it historically, so um, excuse my ignorance, is it historically Irish? No, okay. not at all. Okay. But it's, to me, having grown up there, mm -hmm. it's a fascinating phenomenon. Right. Uh, as an example of, of the advent of suburbia. Right. And as an, as an example of how people adapt to changing circumstances. American history is, is mm -hmm. implicit in that story. Uh, wars, conflicts, economic difficulties, depressions. Mm -hmm. And if you look hard enough, in any community, it could be the, the community you grew up in, Cambria Heights, mm -hmm. there's a fascinating story to be told there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, if God willing, at some point I'll get a chance to tell New White Park's story to a larger audience. But mm -hmm. 
Meanwhile, I continue to stumble upon fascinating aspects of New Hyde Park history and that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that Irish history as well. Well, yeah, that that's front and center my my uh, focus for the, the vast majority of my time mm -hmm. these days. Yeah. Closing thoughts, Jerry. I would say, take the time to share your story, mm -hmm. and I say that to the audience at large because the the human the human experiment is a fascinating one. It's full of poignancy and struggle and success, mm -hmm. and setbacks, resiliency. I, I just am, am thrilled when I get an opportunity to hear people tell me about their lives. And I, I think it's, a, it's probably a good recipe for world peace. <laughs> <laughs> Take so. the time to tell your story. And listen to other people's stories, yeah. That absolutely. is great. That's a great way to end Communication Corner. Take the time to tell your story. That's kind of what we do here at Communication Corner. Tell the stories um, and communicate them to the greater Queens world at large. Thanks so much for sitting down with us, Jerry Regan. Great pleasure. TheWildGeese.com. For more information about Jerry, you can go to the site, TheWildGeese.com. Can they email you as well? Absolutely. Yeah, it would be Jer. G E R mm -hmm. at the wild geese dot com. Okay. That's uh -huh. G E R, mm -hmm. not to be confused with <laughs> the other Jerry Lewis, which Okay. <laughs> G, G E R. G E R at the, the wild, wild geese dot com. Dot com. Are you guys on Facebook or anything as well? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. We mm -hmm. five thousand strong. Oh, on Facebook. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways people can connect with us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So connect with Jerry, thewildgeese.com. Look for him on Facebook as well at the Wild Geese on Facebook with five thousand people strong. And of course, thanks so much for joining us here on Communication Corner. As always, I'm your host, Gail Lewis. Feel free to email me, newday2010 at yahoo.com. Read my blog, I don't have issues.com. <laughs> and of course, tune in at Communication Corner the next time. For everyone here, thanks for watching and have a great night. <laughs> 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 Take them from